All right. And I don't know where Esther is. Is Esther here? I'm here. Well, come on. Come <laughs> us, Esther. You're part of the bunch okay. here. Yeah. We're joining the group up here. Good. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, the Sunday afternoon with programs um, happen usually in conjunction with the exhibits that we have. And um, this is a very special one that we have today in conjunction with the music festival. So we have a few things on display, photographs and memorabilia, etc. And um, uh, we, we are very delighted to have Marsha Lauder with us today. And I'm going to ask Esther Cope to introduce her. Great, so, wonderful. Thank you very go. much, Judy. And Mayor would like if you, the mic is on. No, no, you need to Marsha. Stand close to Marsha. Stand no, close no, to Marsha. No, I, I got it all. I, <laughs> we're Actually, fine. why don't we no, put yeah. Marsha here? Yeah, yeah. I'll stand next to Marsha <laughs> here and introduce her. How's that? Excitement. We love excitement. That's, Perfect. that's wonderful. Well, Perfect. Perfect. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you all for coming. And um, I wanted to give you, we're really pleased to have Marsha to speak with you about Tales of the Festival because she's been involved with the Mendocino Music Festival from the very beginning. So let me tell you a little else about Marsha. She was raised in the Pacific Northwest and credits her initial passion for classical music to the time she spent playing in the Portland Junior Symphony as a student. She studied with many notable uh, teachers and has had private students of her own since she was 12 years old. <laughs> Got that? Private students since she was 12 years old, she started very, or Marsha, you started very early. <laughs> Marsha especially loves the variety of experiences, experiences she has had through playing the violin. She's played in backup orchestras for Smokey Robinson, <laughs> Judy Collins, <laughs> Johnny Mathis, mm -hmm. and once performed in a chamber group for a birthday party at the Francis Ford Coppola Farmhouse. Mm -hmm. She won a seat in the Santa Rosa Symphony in 1978 and has been making the lengthy journey back and forth ever since. Because you live down in... El Wallala. Oh, Wallala, mm -hmm. right. She is concert master of the Symphony of the, Res of the Redwoods and has been associate concert master for the Mendocino Music Festival for these entire 30 years. So we have the expert here. With the chamber group Sonatina, is that correct? Sonatina, Marsha plays for weddings and spe special events all over the country. She hosts a weekly radio program on contemporary classic music on KZYX and has published a book that she hopes will be helpful to brides traveling to the area to get married in Mendocino. And that is your Mendocino wedding. You might pass that on to younger <laughs> friends that you might have. Thank Marcia, you. please, thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. I'm delighted that all of you want to know about the history of the music festival. And, you know, I see so many faces that have been involved in the festival from the very beginning, too. So I hope that you'll also uh, contribute your ideas and, and comments as we go along. Uh, I was sort of thinking that in, in honor of this lovely heritage house that we would sort of pretend we were in our jammies around the fireplace and <laughs> having a little conversation before dark and, and telling stories or something like that. So, so let's go. So in the beginning was a garish yellow and black tent, striped like old-fashioned prison suits. And it looked enough like a circus tent that small private planes would circle overhead while we were having our afternoon rehearsals because they thought they were going to see the clowns and the elephants any minute. <laughs> this was in 1987. And when there was a fire or an accident, the piercing siren from the firehouse would go off in the middle of whatever was going on. And I actually thought we were through with that, but that happened last Saturday, <laughs> too. I, a week ago yesterday, when during the wonderful Bach uh, concert that uh, Jeff Nuttall was giving, the siren went off, and I hadn't heard that in years. So it must have been something really serious, because... I don't think that's happened for a while, but it used to happen all the time, and you could be in the middle of anything, and it would go off, and that was kind of a problem, day or night. Um, let's see. 
that, that well, and the, that's one of the reasons that we changed the schedule this year was because those tent walls don't stop any of the sounds from outside. And I'm sure you've all experienced that in the concerts, mm -hmm. that you hear the car alarms, you hear the motorcycles revving up, you hear anybody's laughter or raucous conversations and amplified music from any place that might be having it. And we know that we just have to be patient and flexible, but we also decided that we could never win that battle, that the noise was always going to be something greater than the music as far as the noise was concerned. And it wasn't fair to the soloists either, that you know, you, the soloists can't compete with car horns and, and things in the middle of their wonderful concerto. And, and so that's why we've changed not having Saturday night performances so much. We're laughing at the pictures behind you. Maybe we should pause them so we can see some <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> there now. <laughs> but the B minor mass is still going to be on Saturday night, so we'll see how well that works out. And many ha people have requested the earlier starting times, and so it'll be interesting for, for everyone to see how they like that, too, especially the 6 o'clock hour on on uh, Sunday night. Um, the addition of the lighted boardwalk is another thing that's been done to help people and I'm, I'm sure that that makes a difference for me and and with the earlier hours starting of the uh, concerts it's also a little bit light when we get through so that's also an advantage. It's amazing that in the very first year of the festival there were eight concerts all together and they were all classical. There were four orchestra and four chamber music. The budget was $75,000, and the festival made a $7,000 profit. <laughs> a labor of love. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. A lot of things were not paid for, probably, and that's, that's a very good point. And then the jazz and world music acts were added for more variety later on, and now we try to break even every year on the budget and try to be careful with how much is spent for acts and uh, and also on the music that we have to rent. And that's one of the main reasons we don't have more contemporary music like Gershwin, even or Copeland, because those things are really expensive to rent the parts. It might be a thousand dollars just for something that takes 10 minutes or something to play. And so it's just not worth it. And you think of all those things as being really old, but they're not in the public domain yet. And if some, if they're, uh, um, Oh, okay. <laughs> Too distracting. <laughs> How long is it public domain? Well, I thought it was about 100 years, but it doesn't automatically happen. If, so, Like Shostakovich or somebody, if their family owns the rights to that music, it doesn't ever necessarily go into the public domain, is my understanding. So it's, you know, sheet music it still has to be either purchased or rented for everybody that's playing in the orchestra. But it doesn't. You don't have to pay that kind of money. You know, it might be forty dollars to rent all the parts for a Beethoven or, or something like that, and so that's that's not nearly as much. One of the truly unique aspects of the music festival from the very beginning was the involvement of local musicians, including several that we have here with us today. As far as I know, there's no other festival that's ever tried to do that. And it was really a unique concept. And you can understand why, because you have all these professional musicians and they don't want to sit next to somebody that isn't as good as they are. And they're always looking at each other to see what they aren't doing quite right and to be critical and you know all that. It's just the nature of the game. And so you know, it can be a little bit touchy to put the two together. And, uh, one failure of the system we had at the beginning was that the professional people were not always told that this was the system we had. And so there were some hard feelings at the very beginning. But it was something that really made a huge difference in our local symphony, as you can imagine, having the local people all sitting with these great players. And that was the idea. It was supposed to be a mentorship and, you know, so it's worked better for some than for others. But it was a training situation that both Alan and Walter, who started the festival, took very seriously. And they, I'll go into that a little bit later about the start of the, the festival itself, but, but that was an important thing. And, you know, it's too bad, really, that the people in the orchestra haven't been kept aware of that because 
it was an important thing, and it's continued for, you know, this entire 30 years to some extent. And Alan is just really a treasure of a conductor because he, could, he has a magical ability to put together an orchestra with a ragtag group and on a moment's notice and with whatever the forces are at hand. And you see that in the Symphony of the Redwoods, you know, for every single concert. And most of you go to those too, I think. Um, there are various stories floating around about how the festival did start. You know, Walter Green wrote a book of his own, and so he has one version. And then there's another version that was appeared in the paper. And, you know, it's just, but I'll tell you what I know. <laughs> <laughs> In the early 1980s, Tyler Lincoln and his mother Ruth L., along with local cellist Marcia Sloan, started the Symphony of the Redwoods. Tyler was a gifted pianist, and he wanted to try doing some piano competitions, and he wanted a group to practice with while he worked on his concertos. So it was a very ragtag group with some serious musicians and a few people that were barely more than beginners. I'm sure you can all remember that. And the second piano concerto that Tyler did with this group was the second Brahms piano concerto, a giant piece he couldn't conduct from the piano, so he needed to find a conductor to do this in his place. So Walter Green had just retired from the San Francisco Symphony from years of playing bassoon, and he moved to Elk, and he was even playing in the Symphony of the Redwoods as long as he didn't have to come to any rehearsals. <laughs> And through friends, he found Alan Pollock to conduct for Tyler while he played this piano concerto. And once the orchestra had a taste of Alan's musical expertise and genius in putting things together, there was no going back. That We really chose Alan over Tyler at that time, but Tyler also wanted to go back to school. He went to UBC and got his master's degree in performance piano. And, uh, and so the local symphony as a whole was really awful at that time, really, really terrible. And Alan and Walter were trying to think of how they could train the local people because it was too far for them to go to San Francisco to take lessons or, or whatever. And then they had this bright idea. What if they had a summer music festival? So you see how this all fits in? Walter could invite his Bay Area friends and they could provide training and mentorships for the local players as well as cultural enrichment for the community. And in order to make that work better, the local players met with Walter weeks before the festival to work on the music before the pros ever showed up. And back then there were maybe 30 or so, wouldn't you say, people that got together for these rehearsals and they also took part in the festival. It was I thought maybe a third or maybe more than that of the total orchestra was local people at the beginning. And now it's down to about a dozen. And the rehearsals then were demanding and intense. And no one had any illusions about what an enormous gap there was between local skills and the people who were coming in. And so everybody had to come to all the rehearsals and they had to be on time and prepared or they couldn't participate in the festival. So it was a serious thing. And everybody learned a lot from that experience and also probably from Walter's uh, rehearsals, but they weren't always the most pleasant in the world because he would always you know, yell at people and he thought if you didn't yell at people that they wouldn't pay attention and wouldn't take it seriously. So that's <laughs> kind of what he did. There are still, still some people here, not in this room, but um, in the community who confuse the orchestra of the Symphony of the Redwoods and the festival. And that's partially because some people do play in both. But let me tell you just a little bit about the musicians who travel up here to play in the festival, the three orchestra concerts and the opera that the festival has every year. The principal players, meaning the leaders of each section, the first violin, the first viola, the first flute, oboe, clarinet, whatever, mostly play in full-time orchestras and make a good living doing that. And they teach usually besides, but they pl usually play in like the San Francisco Symphony or the ballet or the opera. And they don't have to play in a lot of different orchestras in order to make a living. And they could play in any orchestra in the world. We're very lucky to have these people come and mentor us and, and provide their, their expertise. And then there are also the, the section people. So you have the first violinist, but then you have all these other people back in the section. 
And those people are mostly professional musicians too, but they work in a variety of part-time orchestras and make their living doing that. And there's a, a charming video that was shown on KQED a few years back called the Freeway Philharmonic, and that's what everybody knows it as is you know you people will say to each other oh yeah I, I do the freeway philharmonic gig you know or whatever and that means that they audition for Marin Fresno Modesto uh, Santa Rosa Santa Cruz and then they have to juggle the schedules of playing and all those things to patch together a full-time living so they spend a lot of time on the road and it's a very complex process to be able to figure out what you can be in and yet not lose the job somewhere else. And so sometimes they have to accept jobs that they wouldn't prefer just because they have to do a certain number in that orchestra or they won't retain their, their tenure. So it can be kind of a, a tricky thing, but it's, it's a video that's worth seeing if you ever get a chance to see it. I happen to have a copy. <laughs> And the, the musicians who come to play in our festival are very dedicated and devoted, and, and they tend to be the same ones just about every year, which is very helpful, even though they all lose money by coming here to play. We don't pay them all that much, and if they stayed home, they would have all the students and all the different you know the shows and all the different things they play. So one of the things we need to appreciate about them is how dedicated they are and that they're willing to do it in spite of the fact that they lose money by doing it. And they love it too, or they wouldn't do it, of course. When everybody shows up for the first rehearsal in the tent, it's like a big family reunion, seeing all these wonderful musicians you might not see anywhere else during the year. You might not know that it was even the musicians, led by Principal Bassoon Carolyn Lockhart, who organized the campaign to buy the tent. And then, so we wouldn't have to rent it every year. And she had seen that the San Jose Symphony, when it folded, had bought their library. And that's how they did it, was by having the musicians all, you know, it was sort of like you get on these uh, fundraising campaigns online now. It was sort of the same idea that you get everybody you know to contribute a little bit and it really adds up over time. One of the biggest changes since the beginning is that as 30 years have passed, all of us are 30 years older. <laughs> and one of the main things that that makes a difference about is that at the beginning, we, almost everybody was young families with children. Oh, we paused your beautiful photographs so that, that because they were so wonderful, they were distracting from the top. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you. Still I know, I know. I know, I thought that was too bad too. But you can imagine what the housing nightmare was like at the time. You know, one musician might bring four children and the babysitter and the dog and the spouse. And, you know, it was just a ton of people to have to put around everywhere. And that really isn't true now. It, it's really a big change over the the years that almost everybody now is either a grandparent or at the beginning, not so many in between, and almost nobody has little kids. So, it, but it was fun for the kids at the time because there were so many of them and somebody was telling me the other day that the babysitter taught them a lot of bad language. <laughs> that they had the, the bassoon player's son who was maybe an older teenager or something was the babysitter when year and they said that the kids came home and oh dear this was not so good but <laughs> but they really got to know each other over the years because it kept happening year after year and the local people had kids too and it was you know it was very festive and fun and uh, some of the the kids who have grown up continue to come back I hear people telling me about it all the time They're like Mark Nashloss that his his kids always want to come here and if they have their own transportation now, they come up with their friends. It was a, just a very different scene. Even the Emerging Artists Program, which you may be aware of, you know, the students who come to, to study here and play chamber music and also play in the, the orchestra, are older now than they used to be because there were problems at the beginning with kids that were just too young. You know, they couldn't 
drive, they didn't have cars, they couldn't all be put together in one place, you know, there wasn't enough privacy, they, they were used to being supervised, they needed, you know, to be provided for their meals and all that and not just let free in town and left to starve to death and so a lot of things about that program have changed over the years too and it's much better organized now. And by the way, you should go to see their program on Friday night. They give a chamber concert at Preston Hall at 4 o'clock, and that's really worth seeing because the, the kids these days are phenomenal. They really do a wonderful job. And just a few words about concert masters. You know who the concert master is. That's the person who walks in separately and tunes the orchestra and leads the, the violins and uh, gives the A for the oboe and so on. And the concert master might have big solo parts in a piece and is responsible for relaying the conductor's wishes to everybody else in the orchestra. The concert master sets the bowing markings for all the string parts so that the music will sound the way the conductor has in mind and also the composer, of course, following the intentions of the, the piece. And you want all the bows in the orchestra to be going the same way at the same time. So we, and it also sounds differently if you don't do that. There were conductors in the past sometimes who on purpose had the bows going different ways at the same time so that it wouldn't make such a definite downbeat or have a strong, such a strong sound when they all did it at the same way. But no two concert masters agree on what those bowings should be. And so every time you get this rental music in the mail, you have to erase all the parts and the the concert master decides what bowings he's going to use for that piece, and then the librarian has to transfer all those marks into the music so that everybody has the same thing, erasing what it might have been before. And sometimes the music gets pretty worn out over time and hard to read because it's been changed so many times. And we, rent, we used to rent our sheet music from the Santa Rosa Symphony, but they said we made too many changes, so they're not willing to <laughs> let us rent it anymore. <laughs> I think we've had six different concert masters since the festival started, and the ones you might remember the best are Jeremy Constant, Dan Smiley, and now Roy Milan. They're all great players and wonderful, gracious leaders with wonderful musical ideas, and I always get to sit next to whoever it is, which is a great treat for me because I learn a lot from them too, and, and they all have such a gracious manner of relaying all these things that they have to teach everybody, and they take it very seriously. You know, they care about how it's done and whether it's done way, one way or another. And so that's sometimes a learning experience if you're not used to that. We have had some weird experiences in the tent over the years too. Mm -hmm. It's not like a stable building, and it's much more vulnerable to attack from both the weather and the people that might be coming through. If it's a windy day, being in the tent can feel like being in a huge sailing ship. The doors flap and the poles all creak and the whole thing almost seems to breathe with you. It isn't as bad now with different flooring materials, but it used to be that there was so much dust that the piano soloists were reluctant to perform and at the very least, they'd have to wipe off the keys before they, they played on them. Some musicians have reluctantly had to stop coming because they had so many allergies from the dust that was created or from molds and things too. And you know, they're not used to the, the environment of the country so much, and which is too bad. And we've had some strange people in the tent too. You might remember the year that one guy came up during a concert through the middle of the hall and picked up the wood chips from the floor and threw them at the violinists that were playing, performing on stage. It's quite a few years ago now, and so you might not have seen that, but it was kind of startling at the time. And one time, somebody else tried to cut the supporting ropes that were holding up the tent, and so now they're very careful about security and making sure that things like that can't happen because you just can't predict what somebody might decide to do. <laughs> but And it's uh, also hard to make everything work consistently in the tent. One time Jeremy Constant was playing his violin concerto and 
all the lights went out in the whole place. You remember that? That he was, I think he was to the slow movement by then, and he could have done the whole thing, probably standing there in the dark, but the orchestra couldn't read the music, and the audience was in the dark too, and so they had to, I don't think it was out for very long, but you know, it's just, you just never know what's going to happen, really. Unfortunately, nobody's ever been hurt. We had a, a piano f collapse on the stage in an early day. They were putting a, up a party, and and uh, I guess they just got too much weight on it or something, but they weren't always as careful then about how things were constructed. And one time the, the uh, risers for the choir fell too, and so that's been something that everybody's had to, to pay attention to. So does anybody... Do you tune the piano frequently? Yes, and, but I don't know if it's any more frequently than anywhere else. Oh because they have a piano tuner hired every year and that person comes and does it, but you know they have to do that everywhere. And when it's moved, for sure, then you have to tune it right away. But uh, I don't know that, I mean, the thing that, that usually makes things out of tune the most is if the temperature changes a great deal. And that might be true if the piano is in the hall overnight. So, and I guess it is. So maybe it does have to be tuned more. I haven't heard that but uh, it's a big job because they have all these, you know, they have the piano series as well as the mm -hmm. concertos and the chamber music, so it's, it's a big job to keep all those pianos going. I wonder what memories any of you might have that you'd like to share that you might have thought of while we were going through all this. Do any of you have any? I remember thing? they had an earthquake one year. Oh, really? I don't remember During that. Performance. Well, you know, it, Maybe you don't notice as much on the stage as you would in the audience. In the <laughs> as long as the stage doesn't fall down. <laughs> yeah, there, it was a small one, but um, being true Californians, most of us just sat, or sat there and like, wrote it out, and then they went on with the music. It was mm -hmm. pretty exciting, though. <laughs> but you could really feel it. Then. Oh, yeah. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, I don't remember. I knew it was all. something different other than just a downbeat or something. <laughs> 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 all right. <laughs> Have very many of you housed people, in, uh, uh, musicians in your homes? This isn't a past. This is about to happen. I'm housing a musician who's leaving, and there's a young um, bass player coming up to take his place. And on Saturday night, his wife and child want to come up. You're talking about three and a half. I can't have them at my house, so we're looking for Saturday night for a bass player, his wife, and a three and a half year old. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody in his room? Any takers? Any takers? Do let me know. So I'd mention it since you were talking yeah, about sure. your family, <laughs> musicians. Uh, probably six years ago, maybe a little longer, it actually rained noticeably. Yeah. during a performance. Oh, wow. So I don't know if it happened yeah. prior to that, but we were sitting there during the performance, and maybe it was a half inch to an inch of rain in July, oh, wow. and the billows in the tent, this was pre-us owning the tent, yeah. and the billows were filling up. <laughs> the, the oh, water, my you see it, sort of. Huh. And Matt Rowland was handling it then, and I don't know what he did at halftime or during the break, but some somebody did something to create a successful evening without them causing a problem. Wow, because you were worried about it dumping on well, them. Well, we didn't know what would happen. It's not like the tent's going to fall down, but mm -hmm. we could get wet. <laughs> Hi, I'm Susan Jewell. I'm also a classical music DJ on KZYX. And uh, I remember the first year we were broadcasting, and it was still in the old tent, and it was all dust and sawdust, and our unit was just on a table, and if we put the ISDN machine on the floor underneath the table. And my engineer set it up, and he plugged it in, and he thought it was fine, so we went off to the bar. <laughs> and oh. I was down there, and I suddenly realized that we weren't bonded to the station. And so I'm down on my hands and knees under the table, doing all the things I can think of, and it's five minutes to eight, it's four minutes to eight, <laughs> starting at eight. And I suddenly thought, there's a second phone number. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is, but I think I know how to get to it. So I'm, you know, little engineer that I am. I'm, 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 push the button. Well, that's very Connect. impressive. I can't do any of that. <laughs> so I start to, you know, sit up and quick bonk on the, you know. <laughs> so I crawl out and I'm standing up there and I'm all full of dust and sawdust and, and, and dirt and, and I'm sneezing. and. I suddenly realize it's 8 o'clock, so I pick up the microphone. I didn't have time to sit down. Go, Good evening, ladies. 
<laughs> wow, that's real professionalism. Do you remember the time when the, the first night when they forgot that all the people would be leaving the tent at the same time? And they didn't light it, and so they were. <laughs> Dick Coleman and a lot of people were going up and down the street, borrowing uh, extension cords and lights. Oh. So you had fancy lights from people's front rooms, and then of course working lights. And so you had this little. It was so funny to walk out and go, what? <laughs> but it worked. Mm. People, nobody tripped. But yeah. Mm -hmm. so. I heard that that first the opening concert was so windy that they were worried that the, the, the tent was going to blow away. Yeah. Right. And we had the same experience during the Bach this year. The wind was wow. really flapping. You could hear oh, the, yeah, that's the right. new flags were really... <laughs> <laughs> that's really nice. Oh, dear. When did KZYX stop broadcasting? Well, the uh, actually the festival asked us to not do it because people were staying home. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, the quality the wasn't tickets. very good, yeah. and the quality wasn't. Good. And they they didn't always get. I think in the big band you couldn't hear what anybody said. Uh -huh. That you could hear the music, but not uh, not anything that was said to the audience. Oh, speaking of saying, when one year they were doing two pieces and they switched them at the last minute, so the first half was suddenly it, and I'm. I'm on the air. I'm, you know, saying, okay, we're going to start, and they suddenly say, we're doing the different one now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we're going to listen to Beethoven now, and you know, he's quite a revolutionary. <laughs> Twelve minutes, I had to just, and I, you know, I'm making it up, so I'm going, not making it up. Sorry, I don't, but, but you know, I haven't you know, just been studying a lot, and so I could, and apparently the station got all these phone calls later saying. That's great. You should do that all the time. We'd love to hear it all the background, you know. So, yeah. Yeah, I just have to improvise. Yeah. I think it's the festival has grown in lots of areas, and one area is the quality of the tent. In the first number of years, it was just the dirt floor, mm -hmm. gopher holes, and, uh, and gophers. You know, yeah, and, Many years I was house manager and best known as the person that rang the bell to get people back in. One year, uh, Mother Skunk went down the aisle followed by Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so cute. Yeah. And there used to be more birds. I noticed I didn't see any birds inside the den anymore. Oh, and yeah. Even the rehearsals. There were always a couple little house sparrows or something. I don't know how you guys got the birds out of the tent. But <laughs> yeah, my mother came with me one year to the, the festival, and she wasn't really much of a music fan, and what she remembered the most was Matt Rowland going up and down on the ladder. It was, she just couldn't believe it. He didn't even touch the rungs. He could just go up and down so fast, and it was so high, and she thought that was very impressive. <laughs> I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Players Committee. Every year during the festival, we have a suggestion box that's put backstage so that the musicians can put their suggestions into it, which is very helpful for the comfort and safety of the musicians and sometimes for the audience too. And it's a rotating membership, rotating membership with people from, that come you know, every year for the, the festival. And they meet as a committee with Alan during the winter time to go over whatever the suggestions are to see what could be done about them. And it's, it's made a lot of difference for a lot of things, you know, like the porta potty at uh, Preston Hall was one of their ideas. And I don't know why we didn't think of that early, earlier, because, you know, the church has always had a problem with water, and you have all these people that are going to want to use the bathroom. I mean, that's just really not very, very practical. And uh, the, the uh, people in the, uh, the players in the orchestra are all in Local 6, the musicians' union. And so they're used to having certain standards for things, too, and the way things are done and, and just the procedures and so on, you know, what kind of temperatures are acceptable to play under and, and uh, what you can do with video recordings and, and not do. Because people are sometimes concerned that if you're recording a, a rehearsal, that that might not be their best performance. And if that's something that's going on YouTube or being used for something that's more lengthy, then that might damage somebody's reputation and the union has all sorts of rules about things like that and um, also about lighting and and uh, it used to be that we would just start well the tent was very seldom ready when we were 
starting our rehearsals. <laughs> so that meant then that the crew would be putting up their huge ladders in the middle of the orchestra anytime we took a break, and sometimes people would leave their equipment and their instruments and things like that, and that was dangerous for the instruments and sometimes dangerous for people if they, you know, somebody would say, oh, that light's in my eyes, so they'd put up a big ladder and climb up right in the middle of everybody, but that wasn't, they didn't think that was really such a good idea, that you'd have to wait till, till later. And once in a while in the rehearsals, you see people with like ball caps or something because the light's in their eyes and they're trying to shield their, their eyes from the, the light. And the, you know, the festival, of course, is not a union organization and we don't want to be. We don't want to be bound by rules, but still a lot of them are good ideas and um, it's just helpful to, to know what they are and to correct the problems that, that everybody notices. So it's, it's helpful to have these little lists of things every year. And it's not an adversarial group. And again, it was the main group that headed the campaign to buy the tent with Carolyn Lockhart that the Players Committee kind of organized that through all the, the musicians, and it was very helpful. Who puts up the tent now? Uh, well, uh, Nick Reed does, and he was always Matt's assistant, right? I think that's, that's right. And so he had always done it and knew how to do it, and especially with that particular tent. And it's stored in parts, I believe, during the year. And uh, did was there a cleaning crew this this year? Uh, uh, yes, they did do some cleaning before they put it up. Mm -hmm. I remember back in the day helping Bob Wynn put the tent up. So oh, really? I, must, I don't know what year that must Oh, my I was, gosh. I'm one of those festival kids. <laughs> 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 when the festival started and my mom was playing, and I think I was 13 the first year I got to play with the festival. Maybe. I don't remember how young I was, but then when the... The scholarship program, as it was then called, the started. I to be a scholarship student. And all that. Just, you were a local learner. Yeah. <laughs> and then I, I came back from college in the summer and got to play. And came my first year of med school, I got to come back. And then after that, it's time to be an adult, I guess. And work. <laughs> but, that was a, a that was a wonderful program. It, yeah, the way to really learn from these. I mean, what an amazing experience to play next to professionals who are, like you said, so. Just Gracious. Open and, yeah, I mean, they're really interested in what's going on with you, and they really are here because they love this community. And mm -hmm. not so, what was that like to raise the fence, uh, the tent? How, how did you actually go oh, about we doing that? Oh, we were just that? going to some place inland, and I don't even remember what road to go get the stuff. Oh, and I only remember because somehow I was the truck got stuck, and but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> There was that one year that they got um, fresh park or fresh, uh, it was something out of the forest and when you walked into the tent it smelled just like Christmas. Oh <laughs> right, yeah they used bark on the floor, yes. I know, yeah they did. What experiences have people had with housing uh, musicians? Anything in particular? Well I had the Del Rey tw uh, Quartet. And I was putting up oh, the wood, wow. but they all came and rehearsed in my front room. <laughs> that was pretty nice. cool. At first, they, you know, I said, "Can I just hide somewhere and listen?" And they, they were a little uncertain, but then I obviously was out of their way, and so they finally said, "Oh, sure." <laughs> so we ended up being friends. Oh, well, that's yeah, great. So go down to see them. Did they send you CDs to play on them? Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> no, I don't get the freebies. Oh, oh, oh no freebies. <laughs> no. I've housed a couple of um, harpists. Oh, really? One wow. for one week, and then she, she left, and the next one came and took her place. But it was wonderful because they would, uh, you know, practice in their bedroom, and it was like living in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> we house martial law every year. They're <laughs> astounded as to how little she has to practice. <laughs> And if she does practice, she's not practicing that night's concert. She's practicing a thing in a week or something. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I remember at your house, I mean, you used to have game nights, exactly. and, yeah. and everybody would come over to ride horses, and, you know, and that was partly because of all the kids that were involved in anything. It was these families that everybody got to know, and it was really a lot of fun. I was the opera singer last year. We had just bought the house and didn't oh. realize that there's a gigantic redwood tree sewer system problem going on. Oh. So they had to be instructed to not use the septic system oh. <laughs> until we figured it out what was going on. Anyway. <laughs> 
Well, Annie, you, know, you had kind of a funny experience with your opera person, too. Well, I had this opera, this young opera singer show up two years ago, and, and I live up a little lake road, and they had told her that, you know, my husband's in walking distance, but it's barely in walking distance. <laughs> and she had high heels and no coat, and I remember oh. saying to her, did you know where you were coming from? <laughs> she said, no, she just... She was just interested in the music. <laughs> so I was driving her back and forth to give her a coat, but you know. But it was fun that, that year they all came up to all the opera singers came up to my house and oh. had, had a little sort of impromptu party at my house. They had a video of the, of their performance and they all came to my house and that was really, you know, it's fun to have the whole group there. And, yeah. yeah. I once put up a percussionist and he was in our back room. And when a tree fell, and it, uh -oh. it, we, we heard the sound starting to go, crash, and then we heard the scream. And so we run down, Bellarine, are you all right? And he's, <laughs> and he's shaking like that. It's like a foot away from his window. Oh, and Jerry wow. and I go, oh, look, more firewood. <laughs> that was not his point of view. <laughs> story that was shared by the fellow that played trombone here for the scotch tasting Don. I think he's oh, second right, yeah. trombone. Mm -hmm. And he's he's been staying he's been coming for quite a few years and the first person that he stayed with he they developed a friendship. So he's been somewhat similar coming back to the same place and 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 so he had a nice little friendship you know story to share. Yeah, and quite a few people have bought houses on Little Rake Road, and it's gotten to be so it's almost a, an artist's community, you know, that you can go up and down, and all these different Musicians. Mindy and Marcia and Marion and Dawn, right. and, Dawn. And, and all these people live along that road, and it's yeah. been, been really kind of fun. We would put people on our horses, and we put musicians and musicians' wives, Mark Neslach's wife, who hadn't ridden for decades. And, and their kids, but there is one, do you know the Soul Quartet? Uh, no. Yeah. Oh, well, There's yeah. There's a oh. viola Soar, with maybe? a Soul Quartet who had never been on a horse ever, uh -huh. and we put them on, and we told them what to do, and he rode off. Wow. <laughs> the horse totally believed him. <laughs> it was a miracle. It was a miracle. It was a miracle. But he was good. He knew what to do with his body. Yeah, it's uh -huh. amazing. Huh. Well, it, it's funny that not all festivals have the same orchestra every year. I mean, not even close. Some of them get a different conductor every year, and they bring their orchestras with them. And so, obviously, that's a whole different kind of experience. You don't get this kind of continuity or friendship or, or feeling like you're coming home in some way. It's, it really um, works well for the collaboration. and. I didn't mean to make fun of the stage crew either. I mean, they work really hard, and we have a great deal of respect for them. And just because strange things have sometimes happened, I mean, they're really careful not to let those things happen now. And, and uh, you know, everything's been learned over the years. There's one thing about Walter Green. Uh, I guess he associated white tents with hospitals and war. Oh, and so he I didn't wanted know that. the striped colored tents, and he really didn't want a white tent, but they didn't have big enough non white tents. So he had to, and my guess is that's why they always have all these flags all over the place. They used to slap you in the face so to distract from the, from the whiteness of the tents and its associations. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, I, I think he isn't given nearly enough credit because I think a lot of the festival is definitely his idea. <laughs> How many years has he not been part of it? How long has it been since he died? Well, right, um, that's my question. Is when did he die? Does anyone remember? I don't know when that was. I don't, I don't know. I think he wasn't totally involved towards the very end either. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, was right. yeah but he was involved. The last place time he he uh, did a, a concert for the for the uh, festival, it was a four bassoon concert of all the most ridiculous things, and he had Larry, the big guy, all right. with him next to him, uh -huh. and uh, he he blew Walter blew the hard part in this quartet, and he just couldn't get it out, and and it went on. And during a quiet spot in it, Larry put his hand on, on Walter's shoulder and basically said, it's okay. But that's the last time he 
I ever saw him perform. Right? Yeah. Wasn't it the year the final symphony was Beethoven nine? Oh, oh yeah. maybe. I think you might remember that. that. I don't. I don't keep track of one year from another. I, they all blend together <laughs> after such a long time. But he was very much valued, and he used to go out in the audience when we were doing rehearsals and listen to see what the sound was and the balance and things like that. Oh, And we, I, you know, I also want to give kudos to the, the board of directors. I think they're really amazing and hardworking, and, and also to the office staff headed by Barbara Faulkner, who's the executive director now. You know, all these people work really hard, and the stage crew. And, you know, with, some people have sometimes credit, uh, criticized Alan for having kind of a dynasty or something, that he and Susan and Julian do a lot of things during the festival, but... As far as we're concerned, we're taking advantage of them. It's it's almost free labor. I mean, Alan works 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year on the festival, and I bet he doesn't make a dollar an hour, probably. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if he's ever figured out what it was, but I guess that'd be pretty hard to do. I don't encourage that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy's, Nancy's the treasurer, so she, <laughs> and, and Jim used to be the treasurer, so. Oh, that's yeah, true. Right. Yeah, and that was yeah, fun. Yes. For that too. <laughs> that's true. We probably Thank didn't pay him anything for that, that composition. Yeah, that's really true. And that really brings me to the main message that I wanted to bring to you today is just thank you. Thank you to the community for supporting the festival for all these years and, and for enabling this wonderful thing to happen all this time. It's certainly not something to take for granted in such a small place where there aren't very many people to pay for things and, and not very much money to go around. And it's just a miracle that it continues to happen every single year in such a, a tiny community. And so that's all I had to say today. Speaking of but, po Pollocks, you know, they're getting older like all of us. Yeah. Is there some plan to keep this thing going? Well, I think the plan is to keep it going, yes. and, and okay. it's, that's a little bit different than, than what you're, you're asking, but um, we, we all sort of think that it's not going to be very diff difficult to find a conductor who's willing to come up and do it, somebody who's good, you know, somebody who's recommended, and that it wouldn't be all that expensive either. You know, what you couldn't replace is Alan's dedication year-round, and it would take a lot of different people doing a lot of different jobs to take that position over. But uh, but I, I think that's it's probably fair, don't you think, Nancy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wish they just said no input signal power will be turned off. Mm -hmm. Are there things being displayed there? Well, yeah, we there were pictures. Okay. pictures, but it got distracting. It might be fun to see it again. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> we, we missed it. We walked it. We snuck it. <laughs> right, I know. Uh, okay. mm -hmm. One of the things, the Mendocino Community Library has a section where they identify local authors and where films were made here. And we now have a large music section. Mm -hmm. And it would be lovely if we had something like you're giving us now a history of the music festival and photos that could be checked out by the community. Hmm. So it's a thought. Marsha, I have a question just for you. You mentioned that you've been seated next to the concert master since the very beginning. Mm -hmm. How did you get to that position at Well, that see, point? that was part of the Symphony of the Redwoods mentorship program. You know, that I was the concert master of the Symphony of the Redwoods, so I got to sit next to the concert master of the festival. Mm -hmm. And that worked, you know, Eric Van Dyke, clarinet, he always got to play second clarinet next to the principal clarinet, and that's how that started off. But, you know, I, I always sort of get tickled about these different Concert masters who take themselves so seriously because I always think, well, I'm still going to be here when you're gone. <laughs> <laughs> At least for a while. We don't know how long this continues. But <laughs> Marcia, how do you determine where anybody sits in a section? Well, it's, it's hard. It's, no, there are, there are no auditions, and it's all... I mean, in a regular orchestra, the thing to know about that is that people audition for a certain seat. 
And so that's where they sit. And it doesn't have anything to do with whether they're better or worse than somebody behind or in front of them. It's that seat became available, and so that's the one they auditioned for. And so it's not flexible. But in this orchestra, it's kind of word of mouth. And you know nobody is supposed to take that seriously about where they're sitting. You might have some of the best players sitting in the back, mostly, I guess, because maybe they're more recent that the people who have done it the longest and that are the best known kind of tend to sit in the front, and the people who are more recent tend to sit in the back. And who decides where the emerging artists sit? Well, they pretty much always just sit in the back because they aren't really, they don't necessarily come to all the rehearsals of the orchestra, and they don't play in everything, and they rotate too. I think there's usually one first violin, one in the first violins, and a couple in the seconds. Is that Lorraine, is that right? You have two emerging artists in the second? I think there's four. Oh, four. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there's also cello and uh, cello and viola players. How many you can squeeze in between the harp and the tympanum? <laughs> 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 and you might notice that they have these big, clear uh, music stand looking things, too, especially around the timpani, and those are the sound shields. And that's so that the people who are sitting between the harp and the timpani don't get blasted out. <laughs> So that's that's a recent addition, and and uh, Eric Kritz pay, picks them up from the Santa Rosa Symphony every year and brings them up, and then takes them back down because we always have a Fourth of July concert down there, so it's pretty handy to be able to pick them up at the, the same time. So if you can't get your scores from the Santa Rosa Symphony anymore, where are you getting? Well, there are companies that rent these things out, you know, the big companies, and they they all sell them to you if you'd rather too. It just depends. But, you know, I don't know how much the difference is. To buy a Haydn symphony or something probably isn't all that expensive, but you wouldn't necessarily want to do that same one a bunch of times, and you don't want a huge library. Usually it's less expensive and makes more sense just to rent whatever, you, whatever you're going to use. Interesting. Yeah. Actually, that's a question. Is it an honor system when you rent or buy music that, you know, you just can't get? One, like one software copy, you have to get one for each individual. Well, it's, it's, a le it's, yeah, it is. it's a legal so requirement. It's a legal, yeah. legal Copyright laws, right. exactly. Yeah. And that used to be true. I mean, I can't even remember what it was like to play music before we had Xeroxes. Yeah. I mean, think about that. I mean, I can remember in the Junior Symphony they mentioned about me at the beginning that we would have composers come and bring their new music for our Junior Symphony to play. And it would be these pieces of cardboard scotch tape together and, you know, with things scribbled and very hard to read and, you know, things have changed so much since then. Now you can Sibelius the whole thing, you know, and change the key or, or whatever and it can be easy to read. The funny thing is that they don't bother to do that very often. So, like, you have the huge parts for the Nutcracker Ballet that are kind of illegible, have lots of mistakes, and you know you have all these different notes with different numbers of ledger lines, and the notes are all flat across. So once you've done it a few times, you know the music, but it isn't at all easy to read. And the the suite that's played all the time, you know, in orchestras, is has been put into regular um, manuscript, but but the original manuscript is still for everything else, and it's. Nobody has any incentive to do that because it would cost them a lot of money to redo those parts, and they have the rights to it, and so everybody has to rent it the way it is, and that's just everybody just deals with that. But it's kind of funny. Well, thank you, Marsh. That was amazing. I loved hearing everything from having wood chips thrown at you <laughs> and the babysitters who taught the musicians' kids bad swear words. <laughs> you know, who knew? <laughs> so thank you all for coming to Kelly House and participating. If you're not a member of the museum, we hope you'll consider joining. There are terrific benefits like a discount on our Sunday afternoon programs. Once a year we publish a historic review, a book that is uh, given out as part of the membership. And then there are other various functions during the year for the membership, which are good fun. 
And uh, our next uh, program will be at the end of this month, the next Sunday review or Sunday afternoon program, and it will be again about the hippies. Bruce Levine is coming back for a third go round to talk about the hippies who came into town in the 60s. And then we will change our exhibit, and it will be called Farm to Table. And that's going to be about agriculture. And um, as yet, I don't know who the speakers will be on that topic. But thank you, Marcia, again. It was just wonderful. And thank you all. <laughs> Thank you.